Um, I think I've had the opportunity to meet uh, most all of you. For, um, for anyone who's joining us this evening that I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Charles Waldheim. I'm the chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you this evening and to introduce uh, our speaker. Um, I was just um, spending a couple of minutes with one of the uh, early copies of the 75th anniversary publication of the GSD uh, instigations. And this was, among other things, um, the work of Peter Christensen and, and Mohsen uh, over the course of the last year, year and a half, associated with the 75th year uh, anniversary of the school and the, the, the school's participation in the uh, 375th anniversary of the, of the university. And it's in that um, context uh, that I would introduce uh, Jack Dangerman. Um, in the last couple of years uh, in the school, we've been spending quite a lot of time talking about um, uh, what Thompson, Ben Thompson referred to as the importance of uh, environment. That is, in the end, education is much more a question of environment uh, than one of method. Um, and we talk quite a lot about the relationship between history, the history of the institutions that we inhabit, um, and the disciplines and the professions that we inhabit uh, in relationship to the contemporary projects that we're engaged in here uh, in the school. Uh, and that reflexivity, that relationship dialectically between uh, institutional history and the present concerns uh, going forward is something that certainly animated uh, our look back over 75 years of the history of the, uh, of the institution. And so among the questions we've been asking ourselves uh, as a part of that have been, um, what kinds of environments, uh, what kind of milieu should we be constructing for our candidates today? Uh, what kinds of tools might be most apt for these uh, unseeable, uh, unimaginable challenges that our graduates will face? Um, if the work of a design school and if a work of the GSD has to do with imagining future possibilities and preparing students across disciplines for a range of activities in respect to design culture. Um, we spend a lot of time grappling with what kinds of experiences and what kinds of techniques uh, should we enable our candidates with here. Uh, and it's been in that context that we've been asking ourselves, how was it that a $1 million grant from the Ford Foundation in the mid-60s produced an environment in which a student in landscape architecture could uh, go forth and produce such an impactful set of uh, tools and techniques and sensibilities. Uh, Pierre Bellanger, my colleague uh, in landscape architecture, and I have been asking these questions in the three years that we've been here. Uh, Pierre, from his interest in landscape infrastructure, me from my own interest in digital media and relationship to, to landscape representation. And it was in that context that about a year and a half ago, Pierre and I co-conspired to invite Jack Dangerman to speak at the school. Uh, on the one hand, in the context of Pierre's uh, landscape infrastructure conference, on the other hand, commemorating the 75th anniversary of the school and the 375th anniversary of the, of the university. Uh, over the course of the past year, we finally were able to align our calendars and we're very pleased to welcome uh, Jack Dangerman. Jack is, as you know, of course, founder and president of uh, ESRI, uh, Environmental Systems Research Institute. He studied uh, undergraduate landscape architecture in his native California at Cal Poly Pomona. He did graduate work uh, in planning at the University of Minnesota before coming here to the GSD in the late 1960s. Um, the story of how it is that uh, a graduate candidate in landscape could emerge, uh, step into uh, the laboratory for computer graphics, and be part of a collaborative effort that went on to change the world is a part of what we hope Jack will present this evening. Um, if you're interested in that story, Nick Chrisman's book, Charting the Unknown, does a great introduction to that story. Um, there are many things I could say. Uh, of course, uh, Jack has been honored and recognized internationally with uh, over, uh, over 10 honorary doctorate degrees, uh, a number of honors and awards internationally. I thought the one thing that I could say to place in context for you uh, the significance of his impact in our fields uh, would be this. Um, as a part of the university's 375th anniversary, they asked each of the schools around campus for their top innovations? What were the top breakthroughs in the last 375 years that have come out of Harvard University research? And somehow, uh, the best minds uh, in the center uh, worked through this enormous list of innovations, and I know our own faculty submitted a list of innovations and breakthroughs. Uh, and the university then published, and this is available online, 16 innovations in the history of the university that have been absolutely game-changing. They have changed the world. Um, that, if you pencil out the math, is about one transformation of the world about every quarter century. 
Among this list of transformations, there are things such as um, anesthesia for surgery. Seems like a good idea. I'm glad we have that one. Um, the idea of human organ transplants. The idea of the first programmable computer. Um, the catcher's mask. It's an interesting list. Um, the GSD, out of our list of the 10 or 12 uh, that we put forth, um, was credited with one such world-changing transformative breakthrough, the invention of GIS. Um, it has been, without question, the most important paradigm shift in landscape representation in the past century. Uh, it's also true that it's changed the way that we work and that we see the world, and through that has changed the world itself. Uh, please welcome Jack Dangerman. Uh, thank you very much, and boy, it got dark very quickly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I'm ver very, very, very appreciative of having this chance to speak tonight to you. Uh, you're a very important group to me. I feel like I've returned to my roots 44 years ago in Memorial Hall across the road here. I was uh, working away on computer mapping uh, technology, and uh, it was part of GSD. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I was thrilled at that time to discover this new emerging kind of technology and also it just responded to emotionally to what I wanted to do and I jumped in. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight, uh, what, what, what actually the origins were like, but also I'm going to cover first in a series of slides the current situation with GIS and where I think it will change and emerge into the future. This first part will be done entirely by PowerPoint, and the last part will be entirely done with conversation, with you, hopefully. Geography, the root or foundation of GIS, is in many, in many ways the science of our planet. Uh, it structures all of the ologies. It, it houses them in a special kind of science, geology, sociology, um, biology, and so on. And it was originally emerging as a kind of exploration field. People would go out and explore the world like these early crusaders or adventurers, and they had the goal of wanting to understand the world and come back and describe it. They would come back to the halls in uh, the Royal Geographic Society and tell about what they did. And we have some of them still alive today, people like Jane Goodall, uh, Sylvia Earle, still exploring, still describing, telling in a kind of qualitative way about our world and helping us understand it. Computational geography had a number of birthplaces. And for me, my favorite, and perhaps as we've already heard, uh, one of the biggest origins was right here in Memorial Hall with Howard Fisher and later building on his work, uh, Carl Steinitz. My first professor of geography, John Borchard, studied central place theory using computers. No graphics involved, but certainly it was spatial in nature. And Dave Simonet at Santa Barbara inventing a lot of what we know about remote sensing and satellite imagery. And Waldo Tobler, the first law of geography. and and others. Uh, one of my favorite friends is Duane Marble, who really played around with computational geography with transportation. I'm using this word carefully to describe what I think was a kind of fun exercise, and ex a kind of adventuresome exercise, much like other geographers had done beforehand. They were curiosity-driven, inventing these algorithms and tools. And uh, they are also often rooted in applications. Well, perhaps not Waldo, but certainly Howard Fisher, who started the lab here, was driving me all the time. Jack, look at applications, not simply the technology itself. And Carl certainly was, was in that space, well, and, and as was Duane Marble. Computational geography over these last 50 years has evolved into what we commonly know today as GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And it is a, a powerful language and a powerful technology for 
just about every field. And I want to share some of those with you tonight as a kind of way for some of you who are not familiar with this field to become more familiar with it. Applications give us the evidence that this is something important. And they certainly exist within the world of monitoring environmental change, these examples showing biomass changes, nutrient pollution, noise, and thousands like them are watching our world change rapidly. It's being used to manage natural resources, oil and gas, uh, water, forests, and changes in the same. These maps show how GIS is being used to discover locations for renewable energy, thermal, tide changes, wind, solar. Here, this example on Harvard campus shows the roof potential of solar energy locations. Uh, well, also GIS, from its very origin here, was interested in creating the future or designing the future or planning the future. And these span across many fields, natural fields, landscape, open space planning, space planning now in buildings are beginning to adopt this GIS notion of smart features, um, and it goes on and on. Managing transportation, transit, or I love this little example in the center, a walking school bus that was designed and laid out where a teacher would walk a group of students through space and time. Uh, managing utilities, these are the sort of infrastructure side, water lines, rail lines, electrical net networks, um, cellular network planning. You can begin to see that GIS in a digital form is a kind of framework for managing and designing and planning for the future. In recent years, GIS has moved into visualizing buildings. Here I'm not talking about CAD or BIM models. Well, maybe in a sense BIM models, but full wall-to-wall -wall urban databases that are intelligent, that I can interact with, rooms that I can interact with or optimize. And here on this campus, for example, we have now a digital campus that people are looking at the future with. Business and economic development. All the big companies sort of w woke up one day, <laughs> it seems like in the last five years. Nike, McDonald's, Target, Walgreens, Walmart, all these big chain stores suddenly got what Walter Isard was talking about 50 years ago, that space matters. It's like a bunch of rubber bands and the best location can be calculated mathematically or computationally. And so GIS is taking off in that space as well. Understanding demographics and human health. Here in the School of Public Health, some of the most interesting work in the world going on uh, about epidemiology. But these other examples also make it clear that this macroscope of, of geospatially referencing health and health facilities gives new insight. And I love this little example in the center of chromosome mapping. It's sort of taking mapping to a different dimension. And it's, it's interactive and analytic in nature. It will open up and, and uncover and discover for us the secrets of how our bodies work uh, in the future. GIS is being used for law enforcement and public safety, catching bad guys or locating facilities like fire stations in the optimum location, and planning for and responding to natural disasters. In the center, we see Governor O'Malley. He's a very famous GIS politician, friends with our, our president, spatializing and talking to, spatializing what's happening in Maryland with respect to disasters. And he spatializes everything, including where he's spending money. Um, he talks to his citizens in a conversation of maps. Uh, very exciting to me. Beyond our little planet, 
we're seeing use of GIS and recently in the uh, picking out of the Mars landing site and it was a successful landing site, thank God. <laughs> I was quite worried about that. Uh, I wasn't really worried, but it is, it is showing the extent of, of where geographic information system technology has gone. Finally, governments are waking up and using maps now, digital maps and digital information systems to provide transparency of where they're spending money, where citizens can get engaged with their government in a new chapter of democracy. Uh, all of the TARP money, for example, was spatialized. All of the stimulus money early in this president's administration was spatialized and citizens could look at where the money was going um, and, and interact with that. That's, uh, that's about the end of my little examples here, except for one important one which is that this technology is starting to show up in STEM. And it's, it's, uh, it's very exciting as a framework for doing project-based learning. People are learning math and science and new methodology approaches in, in approaching uh, K through 12 education with project-based efforts. Good friend of mine started this off about two decades ago with something called Get the Lead Out. Have any of you heard about this example? A few of you, perhaps. Uh, he got five inner city kids in Detroit interested in computers. They were in the 10th grade and asked them, what kind of project would you like to work on? And one of them said, lead poisoning, because one of my siblings got sick and died from lead poisoning. So they measured it. They analyzed it and found out it was related to dilapidated housing. Then they made a little project plan called Get the Lead Out, which was to scrape all the lead paint off of the dilapidated homes in Detroit. They took these maps that illustrated all of this to the city council. They got a $300,000 grant and had summer jobs for all their friends in high school. Three of those kids went on to University of Michigan, got, into, got out of the ghetto got into the mainstream, two graduated with geography degrees and one in forestry, I believe. A remarkable, remarkable little thing occurred uh, that kids were able to very quickly do project-based geodesign, uh, almost all on their own. We replicated that uh, with a school kit for kids that went all over the world. Hundreds of projects were done in Kenya and Turkey in Cincinnati, where kids would pick an issue, gather some data, do some analytics, make a solution, and get involved in their community. So it it's, uh, has, has a funny little way of, of showing up in all kinds of applications, one of which is project-based learning design. Uh, GIS, as I'm trying to get across, is making a difference at a lot of different scales. Um, these little little projects, little thumbnails of work going on on the planet, but it's also helping us understand things like global climate change for the entire world. This is the, the next 80 years forecast aggregating the 17 uh, IPPC models for global climate change. And it's an extraordinary map because it does show that the world's gonna get warmer given the best, most optimum conditions everywhere. Up in the or upper north, it's between 10 and 12 degrees. The only place that seems to survive is down in uh, Argentina or, um, well, that's about it. This means that we're gonna be living in a different world. GIS tells stories like this, and I'll come back to this uh, story uh, in a couple of minutes, but all of these little footprints of work why perhaps people think of this as a profound technology is that it provides understanding, like this map did here. It also drives efficiency or helps us communicate or helps us make decisions. So these couple of million people now that use GIS on a regular basis, these examples that I showed you, are making huge footprints in our evolution on the planet. Some of them big, some of them small, some of them quite focused. There's also efforts going on to bring together these individual efforts into 
what people sometimes call spatial data infrastructure. These examples, like all of China, is getting their act together, building an architecture where their geology and their hydrology and their and their different ologies and departments are being are are the data is being integrated, brought together into a national planning system for their their uh, their planning board. The city of Geneva, this purple thing in the lower right has GIS in the center and it runs the entire city. It isn't the money that's running the entire city, although that's a part of it, or simply work management as a discipline. No, it's the geographic information that's kind of the hub that drives planning, drives engineering, drives operations, etc. And similarly in Abu Dhabi and Bogota, um, Brazil, Inspire in Europe, and um, even here in the US, we're starting to get our act together with respect to national agencies sharing data between and among each other, uh, a kind of geospatial platform is what it's called here. I thought I would change subjects for a second and talk about just a little bit of my early work after leaving Harvard, just because it might be interesting. Um, when I left here, I was quite excited. Laura and I were working over in the lab and doing our key punching and trying to get get through college. But it started to emerge to both her and I that we actually had uncovered something that could be could take us in a in a direction. It could actually be our life's work. No no kidding. I mean we we had the conversations. We were just kids of course, but it um we began to realize that, I mean, this was the 60s, right? There was revolution going on, shut Harvard down. There was war protesters over everywhere. Let's see, was anybody here? Perhaps no one was here. You were here, do you remember those days? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was awkward, and that was the beginning of the environmental movement, the 60s. Silent Spring, uh, and lots of lots of talk about what, what can we do. And most of it was political and sort of reactionary. And the thought that we had was, can we take this emerging computer mapping and database stuff and analytic stuff and actually bring it into applications dealing with environmental management and environmental planning and uh, use it? And uh, so it wasn't exactly perfect in our minds, but certainly the idea was there that we could bring rational thinking and reason to um, a very political world. And that's, that's what got us started. We started very modestly with just her and I and a couple of other people that we hired, and we worked our way for about uh, 10 years up to about 100 people doing projects, little projects, and I'm going to share a couple of those projects. Uh, they weren't uh, rocket science. They were leveraging what we had learned here at the lab and um, using tools that were originally from the lab and then we started building our own and sort of homemade software for about a decade there. And that, well, let me just show you some examples. At that time, we were trying to figure out, does this technology actually work in cities, an urban information system or a planning information system? And uh, this was a little sketch of a methodology. It's a five-step method, vertically aligned, which called for the development of a GIS for a whole city. At that time, the city of Los Angeles uh, hired us. This was 71, I believe to do a design. There were 17 different mapping departments, different scales of maps, different, different missions, uh, and all these mapping departments were updating the maps every time any change was made. So they asked us to first look at user needs. That's column number one. What do you do in order to discover how we could design a system to make things better? What do you actually do? So we were diagnosing <coughs> talking with trying to figure out what what a fire person did with a map or what a what a police person did with a map or what an engineer did with a map their records that they maintained and then 
what did the Public Works Department do with all of this information? So step one was really inquiry and documentation of what they did and what data they used. And then step two was to inventory all the data to bring it together. And we found that cities mostly had between 10 and 15 different map series that they maintained manually. Some of them had gone ahead and automated it in different CAD environments. Actually, it was before CAD really emerged much. Step three was to actually design a data model which would be one database instead of 17. So all these maps had a purpose. They were different scales. They had different symbols on them. But what we discovered is they pretty much had the same data underneath them. But we couldn't really bring it together because the technology wasn't there. So designing a data model, designing this multiple scales, its update frequency, et cetera. And step four was then to design a system, a software system, a hardware system, an organizational system for maintaining and using this data, and then finally to make an implementation plan. This was early work, kind of boring in a way, uh, but not for me. It was exciting for me because it was a systematic way to look at the information side and application side of a city. It's like, in, like, like a research laboratory. Now I'm going to sh share with you what happened is uh, I did this in many cities. I did it in a lot of American cities. I did it in actually in Baghdad long before the war. Um, I did it in uh, Istanbul. We did it in uh, Madrid. And we made an interesting discovery. And the discovery is that all cities basically do the same thing. They all do 32 spatial things. These are a list of them, the details of which don't really matter. And this was a kind of big aha moment for me. They all route trucks. They all do zoning. They all do planning of some sort. They all have cadastral records. Um, they all disseminate some form of public information. Doesn't matter whether it's a communist city at the time or um, whatever. These tasks or workflows required, we discovered, common generic geoprocessing, we'd call it geoprocessing things. This is a little example of a buffer zone, like a buffer around a point or a buffer around a line. This was the birthing of a kind of language, like proximity analysis. We needed, in order to carry out each of these 32 things, a vocabulary of these, vocabulary of these little generic geometric tools. So if we look at the whole matrix of it, down the left, these 32 different functions, and across the top, all these functions that needed to be invented. Some of them were tabular, some of them were uh, geometric in nature. You follow me on this notion? This, this, voc this matrix became actually the foundation for the very first piece of software that we wrote from scratch, and it was done by Scott Morehouse, my colleague, also a sort of graduate of the Lab for Computer Graphics here. Uh, he started from scratch. He threw 10 years of our homemade software away and said, let's start over and build a first principles uh, foundation based on what we saw people doing. So we also discovered that these 32 different functions either used or created geographic data. And those geographic data types could be organized into these six categories. Those 32 functions created or used base maps. They created or used land records or engineering layers or roads or addresses like that. So we began to conceive of the notion of an urban data model surrounded by tools that you could configure as a language system to support different applications. This was 1979, 1980, early, early days. This is like first principles, GIS for urban stuff. And I'm sure there was great work like this going on in many other places, but this was, this was for us the beginning of and the foundation for ARC Info. Uh, well, that's history. 
enough history. That foundational stuff went into cities. It spread all over the world. All over the world, there's now something like 10,000 cities that use this. Not all of it. Not all 32 functions, certainly, but some aspects of this in doing their work. Los Angeles has uh, currently almost every one of the departments automated. Seattle is another good example. Beijing is a very good example. Paris is a good example. These are big enterprise systems that are thumping away, updating the database and using this core database in different departments. And the result has been efficiency and better decision making and better communication. Why is it so compelling now? I keep returning to this question. And in preparation of this, for this evening, I thought, OK, there's probably six big things that, that we might ex use to explain why all of a sudden there is a, there's a big jump. Because have you noticed there is a big jump in this field, uh, especially this year? It's just taking off. And, I, and I, I've been struggling to figure out why. Most of these reasons are old reasons, except for the last one, which I'll, which I'll spend more time on. Maps communicate, easy to understand. They're a visual language. GIS integrates the ologies and integrates departments and facilitates collaboration. I suppose maps do the same thing, sort of, but GIS, particularly in the digital mode, does this enormously. Spatial analytics, the very, the very core science that Walter Izard, both at Penn and here, invented with the big blue book 50 years ago, um, creates understanding. We can understand our world through spatial analysis. And 3D GIS, this is relatively a new phenomenon, uh, helps us visualize and understand. And geodesign, one of the subtopics of my talk this evening, is helping, is helping us create a better future. I think in that, in that technology, in that concept, in that methodology that Carl uh, pioneered, uh, promises to build a sustainable world. And God only knows we need to do this. And finally, technology, which I've lived with my entire career, is is changing once again. But unlike moving from mainframe to minis or minis to workstations or workstations to PCs or PCs to client servers, or this change is as dramatic, from my perspective, as anything I've ever seen. It, was, it is as dramatic emotionally for me as when I first saw the first computer maps being made 45 years ago. Well. Let's talk about these six. First, maps communicate stories. And these are six little stories that I want to touch on. The first one is this map, seemingly not very interesting, of Haiti. There's a little red dot down here at the bottom, which is the hospital, the Adventist Hospital in Haiti. This map didn't have the red dot for eight days. As a result, that hospital got no supplies. One of my friends, I just got this map from him, a couple weeks ago, flew down there and uh, couldn't get UN supplies. This is the UN map for Haiti for how they allocated all the supplies, you know, medical supplies to all the hospitals. All the other hospitals got supplies, but not that one. So he discovered that the hospital was no longer on their map. They'd taken it off. They thought it was destroyed. So he called a friend of his in, in California, and they called the UN, and three hours after they got the dot on the map, supply trucks started rolling in. Isn't that an interesting story? It was to me. This, this is a story about the tsunami. You can see Japan and North America. This map was made years ago, but when the tsunami hit, somebody poured the tsunami data into it and the map came alive about an hour after the earthquake. And it saved lives. In Hawaii, I met with the mayor of why he was saying, boy, we were able to evacuate the area and it saved lives. It's a very compelling, timely map. This map is also, well, was not so timely. This is the map of Fukushima, and this is the radiation plume. This map apparently was kept a secret for four months. 
So they evacuated four kilometers, but the result of this map not being disseminated widely is how the radiation got in the milk supply and contaminated all the people. It's a very interesting map story. This is a map of biodiversity hotspots in South Africa, and well, Ed Wilson would be very interested in this map. It's what, are, what areas are the remaining hot spots left that we have to put into con conservation. It tells a story, and this map shows where the World Bank is spending money this year. You can see a lot of it's going into Greece, and it tells a story. Uh, and this one is Walmart's map for selecting real estate. It tells a story, too, where the, where the most profitable location is to locate a store. And, uh, and finally, climate change, it's, it's a story that we hear about, but seeing it is a little bit more interesting than simply talking about it. My colleague, Alan Carroll, who uh, used to be the chief cartographer from the National Geographic Society, now works with me, he puts out one of these maps every week. He calls it uh, story maps. And you can go to this website there are now dozens of them. Not only are there interesting maps about just about every subject, also the templates are there. So you can download a template and pour your own data into the map story and republish it in about five minutes. So it's, this is going to be a big thing with GIS and one of the reasons I think why particularly now it's starting to take off uh, like I've never seen. Second, GIS is about integration, and this is also a pretty old story. I think it's why I got excited about it 45 years ago. I could take different maps from different ologies and integrate them and see the whole. This is no different than Ian McCard did with plastic overlays, except that I could ac actually analyze it. And maps facilitate communication and also maps within organizations break down, break down the barriers between different parts of the organization and, and also different disciplines. And we see this right here on Harvard campus, don't we? I mean, it, I think we do. I mean, last time I was here, I saw it, that starting to get cross-cutting thinking because we have a GIS center here that can bring this information together. Third big reason is spatial analytics keep marching forward. I mean, we had great analytics in, in 1967 and 68 with computer maps, but now new tools are being invented. Space time, exploratory regression, spatial statistics keep, uh, keep getting better. And uh, that, that to me is, is able to open up and provide new insights and People like these big money people like this. And people that are planners can rest on the, and be more assured because they actually understand how the world works. Uh, if we locate here, what actually is going to happen? Not a new idea. Certainly we thought about this idea uh, 45 years ago uh, for sure, but the little tools are falling into place that allow this to become easier to do. Next, 3D GIS, unlike 2D GIS in the past, is helping us visualize and do 3D analytics. And this is providing us a, a platform for design. Particularly in the upper right corner are some new parametric tools which allow us to parametrically define things and see architecture through parametric change both at the architecture level, like this little animated example shows, uh, but also at the urban design level. And not simply things like SketchUp, but actually things that allow us to s sketch up <laughs> 3D reality are starting to emerge. And these little sketching tools not only allow us to visualize, but also immediately do 3D analytics, shade analysis, shadow analysis, buffer zones, and the like. And this stuff is actually getting to where we can, we can scale it up um, to very, very large volumes and not simply visualization, but, um, you know, 
smart visualization. Fifth, geodesign is coming into its own. This is really the integration of science and geographic knowledge with the interactive design process so we can look at alternative scenarios and uh, visualize them and analyze the impacts. Now, this is kind of still clumsy in my view. The tools are starting to emerge to be able to do it, but it's still a hand, kind of a handmade uh, tinkering together of pieces. Uh, on the other hand, Carl's book is now out on geodesign, a foundational uh, piece. Uh, there are pieces of technology that are falling into place that allow us to bring the, bring the pieces together, things like sketching or, or visualization, and, and I think this is launched, just like landscape architecture was launched here 100 and some years ago. Geodesign should be, I think, launched here as a general disciplinary, multidisciplinary design, design field that doesn't just belong to architects or landscape architects or urban designers, but is open to the business school and open to, um, well, everybody on the campus, teaching them design based on the science of geography and geographic knowledge. This has got its roots, of course, a long time ago with McCargian plastic overlays. I used to do this, <laughs> cutting my fingers, and so did my wife, Laura. That's why we came here, because at Minnesota we were cutting the plastic. And uh, do you remember that? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of nightmarish. Some of you might have done it. But his theory of bringing different geographic parameters together to help structure how we could create a better future was sound. I think GIS will provide a platform for geodesign in many fields so that individuals will be doing geodesign considering all the factors. Groups will be doing geodesign considering using web tools. And I think ultimately, I'm a little ahead of myself, but ultimately, Ultimately, everyone will be considering the geographic factors and the consequences of their actions, and that will go beyond the design fields. That's my theory. Finally, uh, the technology is changing. And this for me, since I've been close to technology for many years, this is the one that, that I know I can predict relatively certainly will change everything. I mean, uh, you may be right that GIS is one of those big things that came out of Harvard, and yet you haven't, it's like you haven't seen nothing yet compared to what's about to emerge. It's going to go pervasive, and it'll go everywhere, and it'll be embedded into everything, just like the web. Historically, we've, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, years, we've used intelligent workstations or desktop tools done by individuals, and we've used server technology for work groups and even brought the servers together to create enterprise GIS. Now, devices are making it available, and the cloud web pattern is a huge jump. So rather than just talk about the technology, I want to step back and talk about a vision of understanding our world using this foundation. You and I are living in a world that's changing rapidly. All of these sort of issues are pretty common language to us now. Things, we, we breathe the same air. We, we live on the same little planet. We, we're worried about our future. If you're not, you're, well, I, I don't want to say. If you're not worried about your future, I, I would be surprised. Your own future, the future of your families, and for some of you, the future of life itself on the planet. All these trends seem to be negative except for a few. We are also at the same time living in a period of huge scientific discovery and technical advancement. It's 
mind-boggling how much data is coming, coming, coming to us, and yet data itself doesn't seem to be enough. We need some kind of integrative knowledge, which the plot, of course, is geographic science and geodesign provide a kind of framework, the framework that a platform for, for understanding our world with these new technologies making geography come alive. GIS has been the single technology focused on integration of our data, of our, of our science, of our information, and communicating all of that integration in the form of a language, maps. Sometimes people write off maps or dis, 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 discard the concept of we can simplify everything in GIS to maps. I love maps because they, they allow us not only to integrate things but also to communicate the knowledge that we know in very simple forms. And, and as I said before, maps tell stories about everything. We have to encourage the design profession to tell stories too. Tell stories, tell, make maps, make maps about a more sustainable future. So maps have been all about history or current status. They've rarely been this magical set of maps called design maps, which which, uh, which we don't know exactly how to do, particularly intelligently uh, on a database. GIS, as I've said three times now, is at a turning point. And the turning point is all about it emerging as a platform, not unlike the internet itself, providing a system for entire organizations, not just GIS professionals. They are very important people, but the platform on which geographic knowledge rides is changing and will be making the very same assets that are attractive to the GI professional uh, accessible to knowledge workers and executives to the public itself and it'll work anywhere and integrate with anything. This really means enabling access. And this isn't something that we're going to vote on it isn't something that we need a school for. It's just emerging on our screen. This platform is leveraging multiple trends. First off, GIS itself is becoming more powerful and easier to use. So instead of having to take a training class, we can just sit and start to use it. Google opened our eyes for how this pattern should work with simple web maps, uh, but they were very simple indeed. The GIS generation that's emerging now are web maps, but intelligent web maps that are wired together with other sensors sensing data sets. So at the same time, GIS is getting powerful and easier to use, and 3D and more modeling. We're also seeing a huge growth in measurement, and big data is on the horizon, data about everything. Uh, and our platform is turning into a much faster and more accessible platform, the cloud. The cloud promises to not only be pervasive like Apple did for music, I can go anywhere and listen to my Apple music from the Apple iPhone and the iCloud, the same is true with geographic knowledge. And these trends are co evolving and converging also with science itself. It's not that geography or geodesign or GIS is living in isolation. The same thing is happening in every, in every field. Um, this will allow us to re-examine the role of GIS. It's going to change. It'll allow us to re-examine the role, uh, re-examine the world itself through different eyes. Uh, and it'll also allow us a platform to integrate knowledge into all human action, geographic knowledge, that is. Let's look at a couple of the elements of this platform. First, it connects traditional GIS through the cloud with pervasive devices. This means my iPad, my iPhone can get at interactive, real-time maps uh, in a simple way. What has been scarce suddenly becomes pervasive. 
web maps, this new medium, are going to provide us the window into this information. While this slide is a little technical, I want to explain that these are servers, distributed services, like the weather or base maps or land use maps or models that might live on computers anywhere. They are expressed in the form of a simple web map that can be discovered and looked at on any device, anytime, anywhere, by anyone. These web maps support visualization. I can pan and zoom and query them. I can edit the web map, and it edits back to the basic database, which might be measuring or being transactionally maintained. And I can run analytics, like these little analytic tools. I can sketch on them. I can do geo-sketching, like here's my plan on my web map, and I can email it to you. Or I can let you look at my sketch in real time in a collaborative space. This cloud GIS integrates all kinds of geospatial data. It's probably worthwhile to note that it's dealing with integrating real-time sensor data or social media information. I can look at tweets in, spatial, in a spatial environment and, and bring it all together, just like GIS itself. These web maps basically take all of these different kinds of data and bring it into a common language and let me publish. So what's the, what's the evidence that this is actually happening? Well, uh, we released a technology to do this, my colleagues and I, in July, or last week of June. Today, about 100 million maps are being made a day of this type. There's about 800,000 maps in the cloud where people are sharing and using each other's data. So this is kind of like the Facebook for geography. I mean, it's a funny way to say it, but it's just early days where geographic knowledge is being openly shared, made available, made public, and usable through free uh, web uh, apps of many types. It changes the user experience. Traditionally, GIS desktop experience of tools and legends are being replaced by, ex for example, the mayor's dashboard. This one modeled after something the mayor of Boston here wanted simple measures with a map where I can pan and zoom on the map and see on Friday morning how it's doing in my city or in my forest or on the military front or in the White House or in FedEx or in my sales department or like that. In other words, common operating pictures bringing together information for everyone, situation awareness about what's happening at the planet or happening in my business or happening in my agency will become commonplace. And it'll be experienced through these, this simple language of cartography. I really appreciate that you're doing a little exhibit over here of cartographic language, reacquainting ourselves with this old language and expressed in a, new, in a new environment. I'll be able to see what everybody else is doing at the same time know what my resources are. This is going to change the discussion. Instead of individuals doing GIS, we'll share through a cloud and connect all individuals. This will, as I say, hmm, enable collaboration in ways that we haven't seen actually ever. This is already working, as I've mentioned, not only by the quantity, but also there are now almost a thousand organizations that have started doing this. Eye on Earth in Europe is an example. They took all the environmental data from every one of the European member states and shared it. And so did the UN. And now they're using each other's data, mashing it up, leveraging each other's measurements through the cloud. It's like sharing music, except it's much richer than music because it can be integrated and dynamically brought together. This is a new kind of shared knowledge or infrastructure. We've not had the platform to do it. We've talked about this concept for years, but it's now able to be done. So geography as a platform will open our world. The enabling technology is now here. This will require new patterns to emerge, new patterns of design, new patterns of science, new patterns of 
communication. We're going to be affected by that. And also, I would say this will require a culture of collaboration and sharing, but what I'm noticing suddenly is that it's creating a collaboration and sharing environment. Uh, people are just attracted to it, whereas in my entire career I had to get data from everybody and talk everybody into giving me some data. This is a different game. People are volunteering their data to be part of the game. And I know that the same phenomena has existed with other social media environments. Um, I'm just so surprised that it's, it's taking off uh, in the same way with this, this technology. So uh, it's, it's going to help a lot of things. It will make GIS pervasive. When, when GIS was on the mainframe, and I remember the old computer center down here walking in the middle of the night, freezing my butt off with cards, there were perhaps a few dozen people that were playing in this field. Then a few thousand. With technology shifts, it went up this ladder. It's predictable for me uh, that it's going to go very, 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 very big. And that will enable uh, both the need for and the emergence of new kinds of applications. Geodesign, if you haven't figured it out, is my favorite of these because I believe it will take what burst itself here in GSD and move it all over the place. But I think GSD now has to also open up organizationally to this notion that we become the design center for the campus. Just like statistics did, just like Peter has done with the GIS center, the notion of geodesign as a discipline across campus uh, needs to be thought about but also business intelligence. Business intelligence is big in IT. 97% of businesses over um, in the top 5,000 category use business, or BI as they call it, for trying to get their business data together and then analyze it to make better decisions. Spatializing BI will mean much greater efficiency from the post office to, to FedEx. It'll also support a new generation of policy initiatives by government, uh, more open government, the ability to do place-based approaches in government, the ability to be more transparent and more accountable through citizens. All of these, these things um, are on the horizon. Leveraging collective geographic knowledge that's being done by all the individual geospatial professionals today. But while I am a technology guy, that's what I spend my life on, I also realize that the technology part is about 5% of the deal. Uh, it also will require to bring this together in a successful way people that understand it with vision and leadership. They take a hold of the agencies and, bring, and organizations and bring them alive. And I'm seeing this actually happening in places like Shell Oil where they want to get the geographic advantage a company, or in our USGS, the senior management there, the secretary, wants to bring it all together because he has vision and he talks to the president every day, or not every day, but he talks with him. And intelligence agencies, they are desperate to have the advantage and they're bringing their infrastructure together and cities and states and NGOs like the Nature Conservancy are just moving very quickly because they have visionary people that get it um, and they move fast. It will require data policy changes, particularly outside the US. I was in Europe last week um, and they're flipping, they're, ch they're changing their data policies from pay per view or charging for data. Uh, three weeks ago, Denmark just released all of its data. Last summer, Finland released all of its data. Norway is now debating about releasing all of its data. And even our, our, uh, our old colleagues in the UK are starting to open up their, their <laughs> geographic data, uh, at least saying so. It'll also require people that can plan and design these systems. This means uh, professionals who understand computing, they understand data, they understand the science of geographic data, they understand how to model it with data models. Um, it also requires governance for these systems. Just like the phone system, 
phones seem like they're free today, but they're not. They're organized into infrastructure. Freeways, highways are organized as social infrastructure. What will be the governance system for spatial data as a platform? Because if everybody buys into it, will it be uh, one organization that runs this? Will it be, how will that, I don't know how that's gonna fall into place, but I do know it will fall into place. It'll be multi-participant, but who pays? Is it pay per view or is it a free service offered to all designers, all, all citizens? Will the benefits of it be so great that government will want to subsidize it because it'll make our world more efficient, it'll make businesses be more efficient, it'll save energy, it'll do all those magical things, which the evidence suggests it does. Um, and that'll take, that'll take also, there'll also be implementation work, although the bulk of this implementation is already being done by people like Amazon and Microsoft and Google building these cloud infrastructures that we can simply rent. Um, that's pretty exciting. It'll also take good people. I mean, it's obvious that people that are creative to envision this infrastructure and build it in pieces will be important. And also a spirit, I think, of collaboration. And, and uh, I'm, a, I'm an idealist in this regard. I believe that it'll, it will happen. Uh, when I speak in China or when I speak in Indonesia or in Europe even, uh, you know, there's a kind of a, well, pessimistic view of this. I don't have a pessimistic view of this. I'm an optimist about this. I really believe not only will it happen, but also I think if it doesn't happen, uh, we're, in serious, we're in serious trouble because it, I think it's just part of our, we need it, we need it desperately in order to f figure out how to sustain our planet. Well, uh, Dean, this is about where I'd like to stop this first part of the talk and, um, and maybe we can turn the lights back on and have a discussion or a conversation. Thank you. We can sit down over here. Yeah. Sit down. So this this thing on is apparently on. Yeah. Can you hear me? So we're okay. I think you should join us. You should sit in the center. No, you should sit in the center. Really. No, no. Tonight you should you should sit in the center. Really. He's a dean, for God's sake. <laughs> I have this one. You need another one. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Good. Thank you so much for uh, this incredible uh, opportunity and. Uh, there is really a, a very strong emotional connection to, uh, to your talk, um, uh, both in terms of what you're doing now, but also, of course, the history um, uh, of, the, of the work. One of the things um, um, I hope that we will be able to, um, to, to engage you in the discussion, and since we're at the GSD and we are the Graduate School of Design, I think it would be appropriate to, um, to seek your ideas and your thoughts specifically in relation to this question of um, design. I'm actually very interested, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of you would be interested to know the moment when you started thinking from GIS to geodesign, which you coined. Uh, because it's, it seems that it's, uh, it's so true, the prevalence of, of information and the, the desire for that and the usefulness of that in so many ways. But the interrelationship between information and design, which then has an impact in terms of the information itself, because it transforms the information, becomes a, a very exciting and very interesting um, prospect. But at the same time, there's a question. I think in the context of a school. 
which we face. When we talk about design, often, um, let's say in some ways the site stands for information to some degree. There is a location. The location represents all the kind of fullness of the possibilities, the criteria, and all of these. And then there is a design that we have to also create in response to that site. So in architectural mm, philosophy or ideas, sometimes people speak of the fact that you have a site, and then there is an architecture that comes to that site. And then the reciprocities between the architecture that exists before, because there is an architecture before, and the site transforms the site that makes something out of the unity of those, which makes it both specific, but at the same time transforms the site as well as the architecture. Now, when you're dealing with, with geodesign, one of the challenges I can imagine, and I, I would love to know what your thoughts are in terms of the future, is that the, the knowledge is very driven from the information. From the, from the information that's available. So as you are developing your concepts of geodesign, I think it would be very interesting to know how you address the relationship between something that might exist before there is the information, before there is GIS, um, as opposed to relying primarily on the information that is driven from or the ideas of design that are driven from the site. We can talk about like site-driven information. Does that make sense? I, you were you were somehow suggesting that that for you geodesign is in its earlier stages. That is not as evolved as the information revolution, so to speak. So I'm just very curious about your thoughts for geodesign and also whether you have any reaction to this to this to the way in which we think about design, for example, in some ways in the context of the school, and what, what thoughts or guidance you might have for us just in terms of the future. You're right. Geodesign's an old idea, and it's a new idea. Um, it's an old idea in the sense that we are bringing, bringing all of our understanding about a site or a landscape together and creating something new. That the Japanese garden designers would spend days or weeks or even years looking at all the seasons and the variations of a site and then they would begin to move things around. Um, all of that experience that they spent gathering that information, we're trying to abstract in digital forms so that it's already there. I don't know about the spiritual dimension of that. I, I don't pretend to, to know that. Uh, but I, I do know that we can abstract reality pretty well. And then what we're trying to do in terms of it being a, a new thing is interact with that digital representation in such a way that I can look at quickly uh, alternative representations of that reality and understand the consequences of alternatives. And that, as Carl first pioneered 40 years ago, uh, using very crude technology, um, and then emerging through, that, that, the, that I think holds promise for us. So let me ask a question of you guys. How many of you are designers here? Uh, how many of you are not? Actually, that's not true. I think you're all designers. I mean, you designed your little outfit this morning, didn't you? Or you just... You're looking fabulous. I can just you're tell You're looking you that, right? fabulous, yeah, right. Or you design how you get to work, or you design where you live, or you design your little family, or you design your relationships, or... I mean, you, the unique trait of human beings is that they design things. They design strategies. So as you do that, the, the, the goal here is that you're able to very quickly in a digital environment uh, look at alternative designs that you lay out, that you create, and understand the consequences of it. Oh, that looks horrible. 
or no, it looks nice in the visual domain, or that's going to generate a lot of traffic, or that's not, or this minimizes the erosion, or this uh, saves a lot of biodiversity, or this, all of those objective functions that we want, uh, this geodesign concept allows us to quickly iterate with. And that's my simple view of this. Um, I, I'm not as um, elaborate or as elegant as what Carl would do, has done in his book about the alternative ways to do geodesign, but for me, it's a simple notion of bringing together the data, being able to model it, interpret it, and then allow me to design alternatives that I can quickly evaluate and bring that to a decision maker. And that's can not just, uncommon to a designer. Can I that? What I'm struck by, first of all, thanks for coming all this way sure. and spending this time. So it's a big commitment of time. It means quite a lot to our community, obviously. Um, in hearing you describe it, both you know the, the, the transition to geodesign and, and what you just said, it strikes me that design, the iterative aspect of design, that is, it's, you, need, you need feedback in, in a very direct, very human way in, in, in real time, um, has shaped your thinking well beyond the subject matter that Esri's been engaged with. Do you feel like that's an accurate reading? I mean, it strikes me that um, maybe rel relative to other, um, other disciplines, your training in design has been such that you seem particularly ac acutely aware of the interactive nature of it and the idea that it is a venue for collaboration. As you were describing what geodesign can do, yes. I kept hearing in my head, that studio. I mean, yes. is, is that fair? I think that the world is waiting out there for geodesign. So I have about 350,000, it's a big number, 350,000 organizations who use my software. Isn't that amazing? I mean, actually several million people hit the keyboards every day and they do something with making maps or analyzing maps. It's, it's really quite amazing. Um, so. What is S3? It had a lot of, it has a lot of dimensions, but one of the dimensions is that we took it to scale. Um, it was no longer a research project. It was no longer us doing projects like we did in the 70s ourselves. We encapsulated the concepts of computational geography and analytics, and to some extent geodesign into this tool that shipped in volume. And that changed things. It changed uh, health, it changed efficiency, it helped people make decisions at a lot of different scales. Where I'm at right now is I want to use that same platform. I want to, listen carefully, I want to extend the same bloody platform so that it does geodesign so that all of a sudden on everybody's screen they get this new thing called geodesign and they start messing around with it and they figure out that all the data that they collected, all the models that they made, all the interpretations that they make, they could actually do design on. And that it isn't something new to buy, it's just part of their little language. You get it? I mean, this is a really important concept. So uh, I'm evidence that you can take things to scale. And uh, we have worked our ass off for the entire life to be able to bring that to scale because it does matter. I mean, that's, that's our sort of passion and our value set. Now I want to collaborate and like you said earlier, um, how can we build the next generation of research and tools and people that can magically create what we've done with GIS and, and transform the world? And we need to do this. This is it. I mean, if we don't, if we do not bring these magical new maps into being, it ain't going to work out. Yeah. No, I'm also struck by the consistent um, reference to societal engagement. I mean, on the one hand, you can imagine geodesign as it is available being uh, an engine through which people outside of the design fields understand the world to have been designed. Yes. Because you can't interact with one of these uh, with one of these interfaces without understanding that in fact design intelligence has been people have been making choices. So I know that there are going to be a lot of questions for the floor, but selfishly, I also want to go back a little bit. And uh, this is my own personal um, kind of pet interest. But how is it that you found landscape architecture? I mean, many many of the audience members stumbled into landscape architecture as I did at one point in time. H how is it that um, you came across the field, and what what drew you to it or originally? 
Okay, so I, I was the son of immigrant parents. They came from Holland, and uh, they were very poor. They never had education. Uh, they uh, were a gardener and a maid. And during the, during the um, Depression, they worked for all these rich people, and they wanted to figure out how they could take their kids and get them into school. So they started a plant nursery. This is a little touching story for me. <laughs> Emotional, but they they did that because they wanted their kids to get the, they wanted to get ahead. So um, they wanted their kids to have the advantage they didn't have, and so we all grew up in a nursery. It was just a perfectly lovely life: watering plants, selling plants, growing plants, propagating plants. And my three brothers and I all went to landscape architecture. So they got us into that program, which started really with a love of plants and then into designing things. So it's first growing things and designing things. And when I got there, I started to get interested in why. Um, and this started at Cal Poly. Why, why do people shop at this shopping center more than that one? So I spent months of my life turning out questionnaires asking people, you know, <laughs> why did they go to this? Is it because of the benches or the trees? or I ask all these questions, and um, this was a time when computers, I, I mean, I used a, a card sorter to do all the tabulations because I couldn't program. Uh, but it was a kind of quantitative reasoning to try to figure out why, beginning of a research uh, career. Uh, and there was, no, there, was no, there was no findings. This is my senior thesis. <laughs> I mean, I was how'd, dead. How'd, that, how'd that work out for yeah, you? It yeah. did work out, <laughs> except for one thing, and that is that at the, last, at the last part of the questionnaire, I asked them to write their address down. And these were seven different shopping centers around Southern California. So I took the addresses and I manually put dots on map. I manually geocoded all those addresses. And what I discovered was what Chris Dolder and Christoph, uh, Christella and Loesch had discovered and, and uh, central place theory. The closer you are, the higher probability. And when you have two shopping centers, you know, I had red or orange dots and blue dots, it was a perfect diffusion cloud. Oh, this was a big discovery. So when I went on to graduate school at Minnesota, John Borchard was there and he explained the whole thing and through theoretical geography. And I became very interested not simply in design. So I went from plants to design to research to geography. And then I started reading here about what was going on with Howard. Computer mapping, I could map out instead of these cutting out all these plastic things. So we came here um, and got into a class with Carl. And I mean, I remember the exact moment. It was in just about this month. 44 years ago, I was in a class and he explained how you could do analytics and it's like I fell in love and I couldn't sleep at night. Uh, so uh, we worked, uh, Laura, my partner back here, and I worked uh, doing all kinds of work in this lab. We had a job in the lab. Uh, so we'd work all night in the lab and we'd go to school. I would go to school in the daytime. Uh, with this emerging thought uh, that this could be a technology that could make a difference. Uh, or this could be our little, I mean, we didn't know exactly what we were doing, but I got a sense that this was something really worthwhile doing. So we kept pushing it and pushing it. And then uh, uh, we graduated and went back to California and started ESRI. Started working with a little computer company first, but that didn't work out, then started the company. And I, I, I know we're gonna move. But at the very big, I mean, this is, an, this is important. From that very moment here to starting that company, uh, we made some fundamental decisions. There's a half a dozen of them that are probably worth hearing. First, we decided never to borrow money. We had very conservative practices. Um, so we never borrowed money. We grew very slowly and we kept to our values. So we didn't try to monetize any of this. We simply said, we'd like to create a neat place where we could do this work. Uh, and we did very modest work for years and years, and just very gradually built up doing bigger work than a whole state and then a whole country and, you know, project by project. 
So this was sort of professional practice. So the teaching of design school, designing a project, approaching problem solving as a project, becoming a consultant, all of that was in our, in our, in our genes. And growing up in the nursery family business, that was also a helpful thing. So uh, way back, one of the things my parents taught both of us is that being a servant is a noble thing. So we were always in service. So when we were doing consulting, that's easy. You're in service to your customers, right? Architects do this all the time. When we created the product, that was about 1979, 1980, 81, we said we'd bring our users or our customers together and they would help us design it and co-evolve it. So they, we decided philosophically that we would be in service to our users. I, I know this kind of sounds a little corny, but for us it was ideal, um, kind of an idealistic philosophy. You, you've mentioned uh, Laura several times, and just knowing that you know that backstory is going to be interesting for all. Can you, how, how did you guys meet? What's that? How does it? You came to collaborate. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't share that much. Laura, do you want to? Uh, shall we get you? Give you the mic. We were sixteen, walking by each other, and I fell in love with her right there. Yeah. Was she filling out one of the surveys at the uh, shopping center? Uh, no, no, no. No, I, I mean, uh, we're very rational people. I'm a bad person to, uh, hard person to live with. I mean, you know, I am. I realize that. But we have had a very supportive relationship through our, through our life. I mean, like any marriage or any um, partnership of any type, you, have, you go through rough patches and uh, you move on. But... Um, it's been part of the reason why we've been successful is our partnership. We help each other. Can we just ask you um, one other quick question before we, we open it up, which is about geography. Yes. Um, because obviously landscape is, is a very important component. The other component is geography. And you know we've been trying to bring geography back to the GSD, to be honest. And in a way, uh, it's very interesting how early you started in terms of the, the sort of the, the reference to, to geography, because also landscape and geography bring together planning. I mean, you're also dealing with this idea of the, of the territorial in a different way. So we could also say that, you know, the ideas of GIS are one of the early sort of manifestations of the relational or the relationship between landscape and planning. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if at, that's at something Minnesota, that you... Yeah. At Minnesota, uh, do you remember Garrett Ekpo? Did you ever meet Garrett? He was a famous landscape architect, passed away, but he was a great designer. He came as a visiting professor to Minnesota. Roger Martin was the head of the school there. Um, and one evening we were all sitting around. He said, you know, Jack, uh, I was expressing to him about geography. He says, you know, landscape... I used to think about it landscaping, but now I think about it not as an adjective or an adverb, but I think about it as a noun. It's the landscape. And the true profession of the landscape architect is to, is to design, conserve, plan, manage the landscape. And that, for me, made a lot of connection right away. It's just the whole studies with Borchard and sort of synergized, boom, just like that, landscape, geography. They're the same. So one of the efforts that we're doing right now is actually building a landscape information system for the entire United States. We've, we'll have it done probably by the 1st of March. This, is a, this has been thought about before. And I think I've told you about this a little bit, Steve. Um, it's a series of 37 layers for the entire US. It's a landscape analytics system. It'll be available in the cloud. People will be able to interact with it and weight the different layers with respect to each other and see maps. This is kind of what that cloud will deliver. So right now, part of the problem with GIS is that you have to go get all the data. That's a lot of work. I mean, it used to be you have to digitize all the data. Now you'll be able to simply uh, subscribe to geographic information for your projects and do analytics and see the maps and then do design on them. So that's, that's where we're pushing 
part. And we could never have done that on top of normal technology. We needed to have the cloud platform to be able to bring it alive. So I, I don't know, the landscape word triggered my mind about that. So we're, um, there's someone there. Can we ask you to raise your hand if you would like, and then um, maybe here to Pierre in the front row? Please, you go ahead first, and then maybe Pierre. Maybe we get a couple of two or three themes on the table, Jack. Is that OK? Sure, and yeah. Before, is that right? So please, go ahead. Hello. And if you can keep it. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. So you had, you had mentioned uh, sharing and collaboration and specific groups like businesses, governments, and professionals uh, using the power of GIS to uh, talk about and work within the built environment. And I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are about uh, non-formal groups like community organizations or activists who are trying to uh, join the conversation with governments uh, and specifically their adoption of other platforms like open source or uh, even piracy uh, in order to be able to make that uh, possible for them? Okay, um, it's a great idea. It was really uh, Ralph Nader's. Can we, can we just ask you to hold that? Okay. Maybe we can just get, get a bunch first. A bunch of things. Sure. Please. Um, yeah, I was really interested in your kind of 36 different tasks that you kind of outlined at the beginning. 32. And then 32. Yeah. 32. I added four. So maybe this is where my question lies, is um, I was thinking about kind of the big data movement and IBM's kind of involvement in the smarter cities and the kind of Cisco. And I kind of wanted to understand how you thought that you fit into that. Did you think that there's four more tasks? Are they data visualization? Is it understanding big data? Um, so I, I would love to uh, hear how you uh, feel like uh, GIS fits into this kind of larger hype around big data. Okay. Here. I thought it might be easier to ask for your email so I can just send you these questions. But sure. there's one that you, you, you slipped in this notion that uh, geospatial, geospatially based design um, will take off and whether or not landscape architects, urban designers or architects really harness it, um, it will take off perhaps beyond the, the walls of design schools. And I'm, I'm curious your points of view in terms of the way that design is taught, for example, in, in, in design schools today, um, let's say professional design schools, um, what you see are some things that need to be changed? Do they necessarily have to systematize their ways, given the fact that we deal a lot with custom, what we imagine to be custom problems or, or customizations, um, and what your views are on, on how to be able to perhaps also leverage the strengths of design schools, given the fact that we're the only ones that really privilege studio-based learning? Okay. Uh, first, two questions you asked. Uh, we make it a matter of policy to give all of our software away to NGOs and MPOs around the world. We have thousands and thousands of them in conservation and humanitarian. Um, that was an idea from Ralph Nader about 20 years ago. He said, look, Jack, the big issue will be the world's going to get digitized, and then there'll be the haves and the have-nots. So we have huge customers that are NGOs, NPOs that we train, provide software and infrastructure for. Um, we do it under a grant program, and we do hundreds of them a week. Uh, with respect to open source, we are standards-based and open. So we respect that community and support it entirely with interoperability, handshakes, and mm, so we like it. We make a lot of our software available as open source, but fundamentally, the business model of S3, S3 is, is, is software products for sale. So open source reflects a, uh, a engineering methodology, and it also uh, reflects a business model. So from an engineering perspective, we admire and use it ourselves. From a business model, we continue to sell our software, but we are very open to interoperability with open source apps. Uh, but the, the first one, 
the NGOs, NPOs, uh, we're, we're, it's in our genes. Uh, with respect to big data, we are moving to a world where virtually everything that moves and changes is measured. Some people call that big data. Uh, examples of it are all the phones, all the movements of all the phones at the same time. Uh, so we have collaboration with IBM going on on their big data engine, uh, Natiza, and other big uh, data initiatives. Most of these, actually, the, the real ones for real applications are happening in the intel and military space where there's just huge amounts of data streams coming in in real time. The methodology for dealing with it deals with geoparsing or geofencing. Uh, we just had a company join us called Geoloki. I don't know if you've ever heard of this company. And the, uh, they're just a delightful young group of people that have built location analytics and um, LBS and geofencing. Uh, so our technology has serving of big data as part of its um, architecture now. This company is integrating, or we will be integrating, those clients with it so that people can do two-way interaction with big data information. Um, I don't see big data as creating a new app for cities. Cities still fundamentally do 32 things spatially, but increasingly cities will use big data to help them understand what's going on in their city, like reading all the social media data and reacting to it. Social media is an example of big data. Um, Geodesign. Geodesign is, is going on all the time. You know developers, they build things. They don't ask architects or planners. They just do it. Farmers, they plant things in the weirdest places. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes they fail. I have a large number of agricultural users and increasingly, they're using GIS, and they want to have geodesign tools to help them be more productive. Um, same is true of the Army. Blue force tracking, that kind of stuff. They're using geodesign all over the place, but none of them are designers. They're kind of like you designing your little outfit. So geodesign, I just take as for granted. It's everywhere. It's, all, it's ongoing now, and my hope is that we can introduce more interesting geodesign tools which allow people to sketch and look at alternatives and get feedbacks by putting it into the fundamental tools that these guys are already using. Um, then what about design schools? What will be their role? Um, I don't know. What should we teach the next generation designer so that they can take advantage of these geodesign tools more effectively? Mm. I don't know. What do you think? Come, come well, on. Paul Cody is going to tell oh, us. what do you I think, think he's, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> that was going to be my question. Yeah. Um, is your mic on, Paul? Seems to be on. There yeah. we go. Um, so that was that was going to be my question. And But maybe I'll give you a, a, a prod in, in the direction. That is, okay. you mentioned that um, geography is like a language that can help us put our ideas together and, and create structures of ideas that could be more than the sum of the parts. So if, if geography is like a language, we know a lot about teaching language, and we know, for example, every fourth grader should be able to diagram a sentence, okay? Is there a corollary with geographical education uh, in terms of that sort of understanding of language? If, if, if every fourth grader should be able to diagram a sentence, if we're here trying to create the vision and leadership that's going to bring this about. Could you think of just a few elements that every Harvard undergrad should learn or every design student should learn? What I learned as an undergraduate landscape architecture was geology, botany, biology, hydrology. I took all those classes, sociology, um, I, I took the basic elements of the classes and they provided a huge 
foundation for me in terms of understanding when I really understood geography when I started to put it together. They gave me the root sciences or some understanding of it. Uh, and yet, when I took those classes, I didn't really know what I was going to do in life. <laughs> I was a very, very bad student in high school, in math particularly. I just almost slunked out of high school. Uh, until I got into college where I started to learn that I needed to learn. And then uh, I think the first class was a structural class where I had to learn, uh, you know, geometry and algebra. But I learned it not, 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 not out of these abstract textbooks. I learned it because I had projects to do. And later, uh, learning GIS, oh, geometry, God. Oh, now I understand what a polygon is and why I needed to understand that. Uh, and I don't know that I'm so uh, different than a lot of kids. They learn by having a context rather than abstractly memorizing things. Or at least maybe I know that that's what's so for me. So given the right setting of problem-based learning, uh, and this is what landscape architecture is all about, isn't it? You give it a problem, people have to learn it, but then you learn the tools as you go along. Um, so my new best friend is a guy called Will I Am. <laughs> you know who he is? <laughs> you guys don't know who he is, do you? You are definitely. He was the, one of the founders of Black Eyed Peas. Laura is going to kill me because she'll say I'm being bogus, but he is. He's come over. He's come over to our office several times now. He came from uh, a ghetto in East LA, and he's using his rapper fame to go back to the ghetto and work in a place called Roosevelt High. And um, so he's elicited me to come in and get resources and teach teachers and get it going. So he's bringing all the coolness and pop culture of rap with GIS attached. <laughs> it's going to be hard to believe. Mark my words, this is going to be interesting to watch. So what he's teaching these kids is, is problem solving. And they'll figure out what tools they need to have if the problems are, are structured right. So. Design school is all about that, isn't it, in a way? You start with simple design problems and you get more and more elaborate and pretty soon you can really do great things. Uh, and you learn those skills and those techniques and those methods to support your work. So as a young landscape architect, I was attracted to computerized mapping in the beginning so I didn't have to cut the plastic and I didn't have to draft so could never letter very well. <laughs> Uh, so I learned this set of tools, and you know, then I, then I really realized what it really meant. Um, so my original attraction transformed when I began to understand the tools. So I don't know if I'm answering your question at all about what should be in a design school with respect to this. I don't think you give up project-based learning or, or studios. I think he, he seems to have a lot more questions that he's reading from his, from his iPhone. But, but yeah. you know, you were mentioning ECPO. We were, I was in um, a, a class that Charles has, a pro seminar in landscape architecture this past week. And in fact, uh, part of the reading had to do with ECPO. And one of the things for people who don't know ECPO that was, that was very important for ECPO was the way that he was interested in, in relational conditions. He was actually interested in the relationship between landscape and uh, architecture. And the idea that it was the interrelationship between the two that was something that he was, uh, was thinking about promoting and so on. And one of the interesting um, consequences of sort of design has impact or design has consequences is that in terms of geodesign, it's very much based on this idea of relationality. That you do something and it has a consequence, but you're actually examining relations. And I think what's what's interesting about what you've been saying also about Carl's um, research with options, with having choices, is that the choices are to some degree, I read them as abstractions, as um, the possibilities of a project that through the comparison, through the, the examination of difference between one option and the other option, you actually then uh, don't discuss things purely in terms of their natural setting, but in terms of their more holistic uh, relational consequences where you are able to discuss 
you know, the, the, um, the variations in terms of project one, project two, project three. Therefore, you make projects in some way. I want to, somehow in our conversation, I want to emphasize the notion of a project, which is different than information, because geodesign is really about this interrelationship that constructs projects, in a way. And so um, the discussion of the relationship between method and its consequence is more than simply the information. That's the exciting thing about your design. And I think if we can figure out a way to discuss this idea of how the options, because there, is, this, there isn't anything terribly naturalistic. There are certain experiences that you've had that makes you choose option three, I assume. And, and I think the discussion of what those things are would be very, very interesting that comes out of what One of thing that design. might be helpful for this conversation is database theory. There's, there's a number of principles in database theory, but one of the theories, uh, one of the principles is uh, if you have a grocery store and you have all the products in the grocery store in the database, you know, vegetables, whatever it is, that you don't want to replicate the data. You only have one copy. That's principle number one. The second principle is that, and the most important one, is that you link work with the database so that as you do work, transactional updates occur on the database. What's a good example? Barcodes. So when you buy something, there's a transaction on the database of the store, and the guy knows what to order. They know what their profits are for that day because, because the transaction was made. So when we look about look at geography and a geographic information system, and particularly something like we're talking about this national landscape system, then how do you maintain it? Very practical issue. Geodesign, which actually gets constructed, is a transaction on a database. So ultimately, as we look at the virtualization of the planet, everything becomes digital. Everything that moves and changes is measured. We have all of it working, then geodesign and design and change are simply transactions on the big database in the sky. And if you set it up that way, then what 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 are the consequences of geodesign, this alternative versus that alternative or a natural outcome? Because you you've got the whole you got the whole stack up there. I mean we're we're queuing up some other questions, but one of the questions that's been central to us in the last couple of years here is why is it do you think that um, our field in particular has been so relatively resistant to computation? I mean, I'm struck by how 45 years ago the field was absolutely at the forefront and is in certain areas. You're talking about landscape architecture? Landscape architecture. I mean, this is um, maybe not you know the, the most important question of the evening, but it's something we spend quite a lot of time on, that we, we had this enormous advantage here. I um, have a good answer. Please. I mean, I have a really good answer. I mean, uh, it's a real practical answer. Uh, most design firms are between 10 and 12 people. They can't afford it. And there isn't any jobs out there to do GIS-based uh, things. So EDA, or now what's it called? Uh, AECOM. AECOM. These large firms were able to do it. There's probably a half a dozen firms that really are eating it up, and they're getting all the business. And they're moving into taking landscape architecture into forest management or into city planning because they have this platform. But a small firm can't afford it. They just can't, they can't even buy the technology to do it. I mean, uh, I have spent a lot of my life talking to ASLA meetings or different. In the, in the first years, it was a joke. I mean, people would, this weird person coming to this meeting, what are you talking about? So, I mean, I, I just remember those meetings that were jarring because it was not anything that was practical um, until you got to scale. And that means a lot of money, and that's beyond the profession's typical domain. And ju just to extend, I mean, that, that's a little bit my experience having arrived here three years ago and having found that in, in our course to do a sequence, the, the computer was not only not available, there was a kind of taboo about it. And at the same moment, uh, the, the, the boutique or design, small-scale design firms are in 
intensively digital and simply not running <laughs> database-based yeah. materials. Is, is that right? There's something else going on, which is uh, at this WWW conference, two of the people that were on the stage, this, this is a conference that uh, was held in my office about three weeks ago with Richard Worman. They had 66 of the smartest people in the world. They talk with each other, kind of like we're talking now. Uh, and you could watch them in conversation. It was the most amazing experience that I've ever seen. Two of the people that were there were um, Tashin, is that his name? Yeah. The bookmaker. And um, John Kamen, Radical Media. John, you know, did all the ads for Apple with the guys, you know, with the little <laughs> dancing men and all this. I mean, he's the, he's the Radical Media in New York, best, best guy, IBM, Apple, everybody uses him. So they had a conversation. So John started off asking uh, this guy, um, do you ever do anything digital? No. No, I don't do anything digital. So John says, well, how's your business? Well, it's pretty good. It's pretty good, you know. In fact, it's great. It's growing a little bit. Well, aren't you feeling a little challenged by the digital? Well, what do you mean by that? Um, so he was like I'm posturing right now for a while. But John started to introduce to him the idea of multimedia books, of how he might get into it. And John is really a sweet man. And at the end of the 20 minutes, you could see that Tashin was warming up to John. Finally, he invited him over to his house because John was telling him how he might move and make that next step. This the classic digital to analog mentoring that goes on. And I've done it sometimes in my life, and people do it to me. Don't you guys have that experience in your life? So in this particular 20 minutes, we saw the transformation of a, of a person from the old school move into the space of the new school dynamically. And it was just really great. And a lot of people shut down. Uh, but a great person will move, and I think some of that legacy stands in the culture so we need to we need to make that transformation certainly in the younger people i see it all over the place but also in the the senior heads of the offices people like garrett garrett respected gis but he didn't want to have anything to do with it and i think you know that, that, that's part of it also. So it's the size and it's also the culture. On that note, I think there are enormous reasons for optimism. What I've seen is that what had characterized the department for many years, the divide between the design types over here and the data-driven empirical types over here, we've declared that war over, no? I mean, and there, are lot, there are a lot of people with mics in their hands, ready to go. I've been thinking about what you said to begin the conversation, was in about uh, site and design. And I think one of the strengths of geodesign, its relationalism, is also perhaps one of the criticisms in that it's often deterministic. There's a uniform direction between site information and site characteristics and site analytics and the design output. And I'm wondering how uh, certain aspects of design thinking that aren't necessarily spatially contingent can reverse that uh, directionality. Uh, thinking about feedback loops, perhaps, how can some of the things that we think about in design form, um, design thinking, start to inform sight? How, how can you reverse that loop? Yes, um, I'm, a, I'm actually a geographer, and I'm very glad to hear the uh, favorable attention to geography and geography education here. I teach uh, both geography and geography pedagogy. And there are standards. In fact, the uh, National Geographic uh, worked with National Council on Geographic Education and uh, AAG um, to publish just last month a second edition, finally, of our geography standards at, at different age levels. And there are grade levels, and there's a lot of ESRI material in there and a little bit of our material from Bridgewater State uh, down the road here. And um, I would one thing that I've really uh, come up against a lot is is, is more and more of the geographic, the navigational tools we need, and a lot of the information we might need in a short-term basis is available to us digitally because of all the great tools that you describe. There's this huge divide between what's available digitally and what people really bring in terms of their own geographic literacy. 
and I'm wondering if you could comment on how to, uh, how to bridge that. And we're actually very close to having some legislation that would uh, cause a commission to be looking into this formally in Massachusetts in the next month. Jack, do you want to answer those two? Because then there are two, maybe we can take two more afterwards. What was your question? That would be Uh, on the uh, deterministic nature of geodesign, um, the, the uh, site analysis informing the design, what kinds of things is Esri doing right now so that design is informing site analysis? I don't think we are. I do a lot of landscaping design, designing gardens, and I use big rocks, very big rocks, like huge. So I don't use paper. I just take the trees and move them around uh, until I like the way they fit. And I do the same thing with these huge cranes and rocks. Uh, and I don't know that I could do it with a computer very well. Uh, I don't think I could ever do it. And I love that process. And it's somehow a spiritual design feeling. I don't know what. So there, I've, I've exposed myself. Uh, does that answer any questions that you're thinking about? Uh, it, I, I, I just don't know uh, that I can get to that level. But if I'm putting a building inside of a city and I put it here versus there and I understand the traffics and the runoff and the, and the impacts of that building, visual, viewshed, all the, I can definitely deal with it at that scale in, in, uh, in a computer. And I would feel more comfortable doing it there than you know, moving a building around. <laughs> Um, so, the, there are some limits, if that's what you're asking me, uh, to to to, uh, to what you can design in in a machine. That's that's my own feeling, at least at this point. Um, I don't know what your question is either. The, the real question is, like, for example, you're working with Will I Am, which I actually do know who he is because of my daughter. Um, who Will I Am, and, and what is it that 37 we. 37 years old, so. Oh, really? Yeah, so don't. <laughs> um, the, uh, what, what is it we need to do to, to have a population, to include an education, a population that's ready to really use these tools effectively, to really understand what they're looking for? Look, at. we didn't have to do anything for Google Earth to be able to be out there or Google Maps to happen. And this sort of simple visualization opened the world's eyes to the power of geography right away. Very simple. Um, and geolocational things like where is it, how do I get there, how do I get my shoe repaired, all those kind of things are, are just popping out as consumer apps. And I think this generation of technology is going to do the same thing. People just start using it. They don't have to be educated if it's simple enough and free and available to them to be able to do it. Okay, so it doesn't have to be free. Look at, look at astronomy. Now I can buy a huge telescope for a couple thousand dollars and become an amateur astronomer. And that's changing the whole world of astronomy. You know, there's more, more stuff being discovered by amateur astronomy than there is by the, by the big guys now. And I, I see the same thing happening in both geography and geodesign is that there'll be a generation of people that download apps like they download music apps and they'll not only navigate the world, they'll start using this information to create a better place. They'll become more sustainable because of their values and their ability and logic to look at things. Um, the world of science is going to open up. People will begin to understand relationships between patterns of cancer geographically and other causes because they'll start looking at relationships and look at geostatistics and hunt for, for causal relationships. And those will be done as probably a lot more by citizen scientists or amateur geographers than they will by, by the traditional uh, geographers. So then what place does traditional geography or traditional design really play? It's not an interesting question because suddenly, <laughs> wait a minute, if it's all going to be taken over, what, I strongly believe in authoritative source and, and um, in terms of measurement and also in terms of science publications. So there'll be a strong role for that and then there'll be this whole world out there. And there'll be a strong, uh, a strong position just like there is today for licensed 
high quality architects which get five stars instead of four stars or three stars because people will make those judgments. And then other people are going to just locate buildings in these weird places like they do now. You know, it's like it's not it's not like they don't do that already. And as we transition to the last uh, question or two, can you just say a word about the business model? Does the business model of selling software transition in the same way? To selling services, you mean? Yeah, I think so. It's so we started selling services 40 years ago, work for hire, just like any architect does. Then we took all of the work of that period and try to encapsulate it into a product. And then the product shipped in volume so we could take that to scale. Uh, so we have these users that do that. Uh, what's occurring now is people are starting to subscribe for a few hundred dollars a year to $50 million of data with all kinds of interesting analytic tools rather than buy their own software or their own hardware. So SaaS, software as a service, and CAS, content as a service, will gradually take over from some of the aspects of software products, except that the software products also connect into these web resources. So if I have a high-end desktop and I'm doing 3D building design, I may want to serve some content in from geography into my own little personal thing. So Microsoft calls this software and services, and that's certainly what we're seeing our users want to do. Also, Shell Oil doesn't want to use the public cloud. They want their own cloud. So they'll buy cloud computers from, Microsoft, from uh, IBM, and they want the software to put on there. So software is not dead. It's being complemented and extended to software and software as a service. Does that help you? Chris? Yes. Um, I moved to uh, the edge of my seat when you started talking about messing around with these tools. Um, and uh, you know, Charles described the design process as an iterative process. It's intrinsically a messy process. See. It does sound like studio. That's the way it's taught here. Um, it's it's the way that I that I work in my professional life, and I think that there are a lot of designers that are very happy when they're surrounded by, you know, the detritus of, of, of styrofoam models and hot glue, and you know, we're kind of in our mode and we're th we're thinking in that way, um, and uh, people get up tight when they're forced to be tied down too early in that process. Right. I can think of many people whose biggest fear is getting tied down too early in the design process. To, to what extent do you think these mapping tools will be liberating in the way that we can stay in that kind of free thinking mode much deeper into the process? I don't think they're there yet where you can mess around. It's too engineered. The, the workplace and the work setting is too, is, requires too much discipline at this point to replace what you do in the messy world of your work scene. That's my real. But eventually. But I, but I, think, it, I think it's moving in that direction. I mean, you see this with caves and labs that, that allow visualization in the round. Um, we see it in oil companies where geologists are messing around doing oil exploration with sketching tools in these 3D environments. Um, that's too expensive at this point, and I think it belongs to the world of research. It's why I would encourage you to restart the lab for computer graphics and spatial analysis in the GSD. Don't you think this is a good idea? Yeah, yeah. So, um, who, I mean, we, we messed around a lot. And I mean, I, I did, but the other people that were in that lab for, for 15 years were um, just amazing people. And they were attracted out of the mathematics department. Um, this kid called Shepard developed one of the first interpolation techniques. Uh, it was He was always around the lab. Did you ever know him, Stephen? <laughs> and, um, well, there was a bunch of them. That was, that was one million US dollars in 1964. It was a half a million dollars. Really? Yeah, it was a, four, it was a well, half the, a million dollars. The price dollars. is going down, it. so I don't know who's got the, the app that converts to you know 2012, 2013 dollars, but um, it's a number. It's not um, an inconceivable amount. 
and uh, it's certainly a project we'd be happy to be a part of. So thank you so much for coming all this way. Yeah, for thank this you guys all for staying. Too. Thanks.